from fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. It is Pod Therapy coming to you by way of the recording studio at UNLV. It's a Dr. Jim only show with a very special guest today. So buckle up, everyone, because here is Dr. Jim Jobin, and this is Pod Therapy. Well, welcome, everybody. I am so excited to be joined by my guest today, and let me just do a little bit of an introduction to him. So Dr. Rick Hansen is a psychologist, senior fellow at UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center, and a New York Times bestselling author. His seven books have been published in 33 languages and sold over a million copies in English alone. He's founder of the Global Compassion Coalition and the Wellspring Institute for Neuroscience and Contemplative Wisdom, as well as the co-host of the Being Well podcast, which has been downloaded over 15 million times. He's lectured at NASA, Google, Oxford, and Harvard. His work has been featured on CBS, NPR, and the BBC, and now finally... He's getting his big break to be a guest on the 48th most popular mental health podcast on Good Pods, Pod Therapy. Dr. Rick Hansen, thank you so much for joining me today. Jim, that was a great introduction. Thank you. <laughs> I'm, fine. I'm glad to be here. You finally made it, buddy. It's a high point. This is your chance. That's it. That's <laughs> Don't it. blow it. Don't blow it. Okay, good. <laughs> so you're in fabulous Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, yeah. You've been guesting here at, at uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Um, you've been speaking in small groups. You're speaking in a large group later on this evening. Is this your first trip to Las Vegas? No, I've been here before. I was here a year ago, and okay. I also caught a day of rock climbing at oh, Red did Rocks. You? you went over to Red Rocks. Good yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, I've been really struck by Las Vegas. I mean, mm. once you, as people say, move out of that you know strip kind of area, right. suddenly it's a whole other world. Thank goodness it is, uh, uh, because we've been getting this F1 race. Have you heard about yeah, this? Yeah, I've seen oh, the ads. Boy, <laughs> They ripped the whole place up to build this racetrack. Right. The locals are just crying because we're all stuck in traffic. But yeah. as a Californian, you, you know a thing or I two. I know about traffic. You've I grew heard up in this. L.A. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> even now, Northern California is starting to suffer the effects. Is it? Oh, there's there's just no winning. Well, a lot of Californians like to come over to, to Nevada and to Las Vegas and relocate. And mm. it's funny because they usually tease us when we complain about traffic. And yeah. they, they say, yeah. you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> <laughs> this is nothing. You can get from one corner to the other. When, when when you're in town, are there any Las Vegas things you like to do? Do you like to see a show? Or are there any shows you have seen? Anything you like to do that's kind of the tourist thing? Uh, I've always been in and out really quickly. Mm. And if I could offer something that is not, not meant as a slur on Las Vegas, but <laughs> as a haunting personal lesson mm. I got. Uh, so I grew up in Los Angeles. I went to Disneyland a lot billed as the happiest place on earth. And when I got a little older and we started taking our kids there, I began observing that in the so-called happiest place on earth, there was a lot of stress, weariness, irritability, exhaustion, and just dealing with a system that is essentially an endless money extraction process. Right. Different situation. I came to Las Vegas, I recall, maybe 35, 40 years ago. I was Mm. much younger then. And I remember walking through a casino and I'm going to reveal a little about myself, Mm -hmm. heterosexual, cisgender male. Mm -hmm. There I was walking through the casino, and I noticed that there was a woman in front of me walking away. And I was, of course, getting the view from the back. Sure. And (laughs) I thought, oh, beautiful, wonderful, Mm -hmm. interesting. And then as I walked past her and she turned, suddenly I saw someone who was really quite old, mm. whose, whose face, you could just tell, had been really ravaged okay. by a lot of hard knocks, mm. a lot of mistreatment, mm-hmm. a lot of difficulty, a lot of suffering. Mm. I'm saying everything I'm saying really out of respect for her. Right. And I realized suddenly that there's a world of difference between the attractive wrapping and what's actually inside the box. Well said, yeah. And I think so much of life these days and everyday practical wisdom mm. is to know the difference between the <laughs> wrapping and the box. Yes. And to be able to not be so manipulated mm. uh, that uh, in ways that often land on our biological vulnerabilities, mm-hmm. whether it's an appeal to greed or an appeal to grievance, yes. which so dominates our current politics, mm-hmm. and to realize we are just vulnerable to those kind of appeals yeah. and to look past them to the substance mm-hmm. of what is actually good for oneself and for those we care about, including in widening circles mm. that include the whole human 
species, a yes. billion of us, and all life on the planet altogether. Mm -hmm. What actually is in our own best interest. Wow. So I'm sure we'll be talking about that. Well, I got to tell you, Las Vegas is not in anybody's best interest. <laughs> we are we are the wrapping paper uh, around mm. all the things that people come uh, to distract themselves <laughs> from the better life. Sure. So That's probably less than 10% of the total. That's I mean, true. I, I got to walk through UNLV, and mm -hmm. I had a really great tofu bowl at the student oh, center. Oh, good. Yay. Yeah. Yay. And uh, a little bit later, I get to be in a museum, and here we are in a library. Yes. And... Yeah, uh, that's another thing I just want to offer, too, about mm. what do we actually notice? Mm -hmm. I mean, we're, I'm a psychologist with a particular interest in the intersection mm. of clinical psychology, which for me includes coaching, the human potential movement, practical mm -hmm. psychology. Okay, the intersection of that with brain science. Yes. What's going on in your brain as your mood lifts or plummets? Mm -hmm. And third, uh, informed by thousands of years of contemplative wisdom. Yes. I'm most informed and trained in the Buddhist tradition, um, which has the most kind of connection with modern science. Uh, there are other traditions as well, and those of the indigenous First Nations native peoples around the world, they too have yeah. contemplative traditions. I I'm glad you're bringing this up. This is an area I really wanted to explore with you. As, as I mentioned in your introduction, yeah. uh, you are a prolific author, uh -huh. and, and several of your books, Buddha's Brain, uh, Neurodharma, they discuss this uh, correlation between Buddhist discipline and mental health. And, and I wonder if you can take us into that to help us understand how did you discover Buddhism, and, and when mm. did you begin sort of untangling how these these two realities, these two areas of passion, these two areas yeah. that have influenced your life, when did you start kind of mixing the chocolate with the peanut butter here uh -huh. and, and creating something special? Well, that's one of the great food combinations, it by is. the way. It is. Yeah, it's a it, catch, pyramid group as far as I'm concerned. Ketchup and french fries. That's, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. Okay, okay, good. Um, um, uh, if I, I'll get into that mm. by kind of completing the, the, the previous point, which is, uh, much as we were just talking about, <clears throat> it's easy to get distracted by the shiny negative objects. Right. Because one of the great useful findings in evolutionary neuropsychology is that the brain has a negativity bias, mm. which helped our ancestors live to see the sunrise. Mm -hmm. You know, back in the day, whether it's the 300,000 years of anatomically modern humans mm -hmm. or the two million years before that in which our ancestors were smart enough to make stone tools, mm -hmm. even with brains eventually about a third our size, and then even before that, down that long run, 600 million years of evolution of the nervous system, our ancestors needed to both get the carrots right. and avoid the sticks. You mm -hmm. know, carrots, food, sticks, predators, et cetera. Right. If you failed to get a carrot today, you'd have a chance at one tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But if you failed to avoid that stick today, ah. whack, no more carrots No more carrots. You're done. So we're biased, exactly mm -hmm. right, to really, really, you know, avoid carrots. And if we survive an encounter with a carrot, pardon me, to avoid sticks. sticks. And mm -hmm. if we um, survive an encounter with a stick, to overlearn from it. That's mm -hmm. the negativity bias, which I makes see. our brain like uh, Velcro for the bad and Teflon for the good. Wow. So when I wander the alleyways of UNLV or <laughs> <laughs> the highways and byways of Las Vegas, I deliberately try to put in a kind of correction factor huh. for that bias. That's not about rose-colored glasses. It's about mm. seeing the world clearly while also making sure I don't miss the many, many people who are just doing their job, mm -hmm. who are just getting through the day, who are good-hearted, who will tell me how to get to the library if I mm -hmm. ask them, who are just trying to get an education. They're just trying to build a house. They're just good. You yeah. know, uh, the sky is still blue, right? You know, the sun is still uh, shining. I woke up this morning rather than the alternative. That's mm -hmm. pretty good. You mm -hmm. know? So I think it's really important to pay attention to attention. Mm -hmm. And that's where the contemplative traditions have a lot to say. And to give thought to where is our attention resting? Because in a traditional saying, the mind takes its shape mm. from what it repeatedly rests upon. Mm. The brain takes its shape since neurons that fire together wire will together. wire together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the brain takes its shape from what we rest upon. So I was drawn to um, the Eastern traditions, I think, by grace. Mm. Certainly there was no good reason why this shy, dorky kid who grew up in an ordinary middle-middle class suburban environment in Los Angeles at the end of his 
uh, time at UCLA, final quarter, needed to get 12 units of independent study. And I said, well, <laughs> I don't know anything about Eastern traditions. I'm going to just check it out. So I did. And suddenly, wow, you know, I appreciated the analysis of the mind I found in Buddhism, especially early Buddhism, which is very psychological yes. and kind of logical. There's not a lot of woo-woo in it. That made a lot of sense to me. Mm. Uh, I was a super casual meditator, kind of foolish, but I think of levels of meditation. Level one is just sit on the couch and stop stressing. Mm. That counts. Yeah. Okay, I kind of had that. <laughs> I kind of had that. And then, you know, you can get deeper and deeper and deeper into it. So I went along there and one after kind of wandering around in a lot of human potential stuff in my 20s, I realized, whoa, I really better go to grad school. Mm. So then I spent my 30s more or less in grad school one way or another, developmental psychology, family systems, and then a clinical PhD. And then in my 40s, I got very interested in what happens when children come along because they had. So my first book, (laughs) Mother Nurture, was about um, the long-term care and support uh, for the people who are doing all of the bearing and most of the rearing, much mm. of the rearing, certainly. Certainly the great majority of the rearing mm-hmm. of our precious children, women. Yes. And that was my first book. And and then along the way with that, I got more deeply into um, contemplative practice, particularly Buddhist contemplative practice. Mm. Uh, and then with that, uh, neuroscience kind of exploded uh, yes. in the 1990s, the decade yes. of the brain. Mm-hmm. And so by the time I uh, did the preliminaries for Buddha's brain and then wrote that book, my second book, uh, there was enough practical brain science that you could actually offer mm. helpful. What I, the subtitle was uh, the practical brain science mm-hmm. of happiness, love, and wisdom. There was enough there. Right. Where we could do the practical stuff. So uh, that's it. That's my background. That's how it all Thanks came together. Thanks for letting me lay that out there. <laughs> well, and it's so interesting to hear about how all these things developed at once. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I, I sort of assumed that you had done your clinical work. And then along the way, uh, perhaps, because I think a lot of clinicians now have discovered mindfulness as a concept. Mm-hmm. And, and I think it's 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 got to be tricky to those who take it extremely seriously, who know it th- back to front, um, to hear the rest of us just sort of casually tossing it out there all the time and say, yeah, try some of this. Yeah. And, and that's got to be annoying, I would imagine. Think, oh, you're so close. <laughs> you're knocking on the right door. If only you would go all the way in. There's mm-hmm. so much here. And I sort of assumed that you had done your academic work and then just discovered this as many of us had. And no, it sounds like for you, you came about it completely organically. And both of these streams of consciousness grew together. Mm-hmm. And so you've been weaving Buddhist mm-hmm. principles, some of these, these thinkings, into your clinical work all along. Pretty much, yeah. Gosh, that's, you know, I got to give you credit. You were there before it was cool. <laughs> uh, maybe I was in, to some extent. Uh, and there's certainly other uh, really, really early adopters you know, mm. long before me. Uh, and then certainly bringing in the neuroscience aspect. Right. Paying attention to, with a sense of gratitude and, and wonder, holy moly, mm. what's going on under the hood? Yeah. You know, right now, um, people listening may already know this brain has about 85 billion neurons Mm. with another 100 billion or so support cells. Typical neurons make up several thousand connections. Well, do the math, that gives us several hundred trillion little microprocessors. Holy cow. Each one of those junctions sparkling away. As uh, Sherrington, an early neuroscientist, referred to it, the brain is the enchanted loom. Wow. Continually weaving the fabric of consciousness. Wow. Wow. And there's so much we don't know. We don't know what's called the hard problem. We don't know the solution yet to the hard problem. How Mm. in the world does the information processing, which is undeniably true, the brain is tangible, it is representing and processing information, which is Mm. intangible, yet exists as a natural phenomenon. That's what we mean by mind. Mind Mm. equals all the information Mm -hmm. represented by a creature's nervous system, Mm. whether it's a complicated creature like you and me, Mm. or an ant with about 100,000 neurons Mm. compared to 85 billion, or a honeybee. Makes me happy that a honeybee has about 10 times as many neurons as an ant. You know, a million Way to go, honeybees. Yay, I think honeybees are having experiences. Yeah. Maybe even ants as well. Uh, In any case, we don't yet know how information translates to hearing and seeing pain and pleasure. We're Mm. We're not exactly clear about that, but we figure there must be a relationship between our experiences, Mm. which map very closely, they correlate very tightly, Mm. flows of experiences 
map very, very tightly to flows of information, which map to flows of neural activity. Mm -hmm. And repeated patterns of neural activity underlying repeated patterns of experiences leave lasting physical traces behind. This, to me, has always been so fascinating. Neuroplasticity is this thing that I, I feel like in, in your tenure in this profession and through your graduate work, you witnessed sort of the discovery of this and, and, and really exploring this in, in real applied purposes. And I still find it fascinating that this is true, that you, you brought it up earlier, that where you put the brain, it takes the shape, you know, yep. water in the cup. We take the shape of the cup and, and, and those neurons firing together, wiring together. For the general audience, we may be talking three or four chapters further than they understand yet. It, whenever you're asked to just explain what we mean, that when we say the, the neurons, the brain, the stuff in your skull yeah. is plastic, yep. what does that mean, Dr. Hansen? Yeah, and please call me Rick so I can call you Jim. There okay. we are. I prefer his holiness, but you may. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Just Jim is uh, fine. <laughs> yeah, you're on thin ice there. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's see here. Well, <clears throat> a simple natural example that we're mm -hmm. used to is that if you, for example, lift some weight mm -hmm. and you do it repeatedly or do some activity, uh, like going for vigorous walks, you will grow muscle. Right. So – the body is changing mm -hmm. based on activity. Well, in the brain, um, its function is to um, basically process information, and you have all these neurons that are connected together. As they repeatedly fire and fire together, which means within a few milliseconds at mm -hmm. the same time, these natural biological processes start literally connecting them together. New little tendrils grow that form new connections between these two neurons. Um, different receptor sites uh, in the downstream neuron become more active because mm. the upstream neuron is sending more little bubbles. They're essentially bubbles called vesicles mm -hmm. of, a, let's say, 100 molecules of serotonin mm. or dopamine or you know, GABA mm -hmm. across that little tiny synaptic cleft so the downstream uh, docking sites. It's a little bit like a container ship arriving with 100 molecules mm. at the docking site, uh, which then receives it. Well, as all that happens, physical changes literally occur wow. in, in your brain. Um, other kinds of changes occur too. For example, at the uh, epigenetic level, the expression of genes. The genes themselves don't change, mm. but the expression of the genes change, again, based on repeated activity. Mm. A blood flow the little tiny capillaries will bring more blood to regions of the brain that are busy because mm. it's like the muscle. You know, they're working more, so they need more blood flow. Mm -hmm. And these kind of um, lasting changes, for better or worse, right? Mm. You can develop more mindfulness, let's say you started there, that is correlated with measurable changes in the brain certainly after eight weeks of a mindfulness training course, and even fairly shorter-lived changes in the brain, even after just a single training experience wow. with mindfulness. You can see discernible changes. You can also see it with trauma. That's amazing. You can see changes in the brain that are lasting based on traumatic experiences. And, and for me, it, it, it almost sounds kind of mysterious. It but does. If you work backwards, you've got once upon a time, Dr. Jobin, you were a <laughs> His little, holiness, thank you. <laughs> you were a little baby. You were a little baby. Mm -hmm. So I'm imagining little Jimmy mm -hmm. who I was learning was to walk and mm -hmm. not crawl. Mm -hmm. And if you've had kids or been around kids, you can imagine that kid learning to walk instead of crawl. Mm -hmm. Well, learning occurred. That kid acquired a, a skill or a strength. Now, fast forward, that kid is in high school and uh, blundering socially – and mm -hmm. then hopefully learning something from it. Oh, don't say that stupid thing the next mm -hmm. time. Or, oh, slow it down more. Or, oh, don't let that bully jerk get into your head. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's learning of some kind. All right. Something has to change in the body if there's learning, by mm -hmm. definition, whether it's two plus two is four or, you know, learning that your parents' alcoholism was not your fault. Wow. Okay, something has to change, mm -hmm. right? And otherwise, you're left with magic. 
Now, Mm -hmm. I believe in some kinds of magic, and Mm -hmm. we may go there, I don't know. But most of the time, if not all the time, inside the natural universe, the Big Bang universe, if there is any kind of change that's durable over time, something has to have changed in the body right, to enable that change in the mind. And where that change typically happens is in the three pounds of coconut, three pounds of tofu-like <laughs> tissue inside the, <laughs> <And> coconut, the coconut. <laughs> inside the coconut that is the brain. That's so wild. And, and one of the things you said that I think fascinates people when they really look into this, when you say the brain is literally changing, yeah. you mean... Honestly, if we look through a device yeah. that allows us to see your brain, and if we can zoom in, we actually see your brain changing shape and structure. And it doesn't mean it's going to take the shape of a triangle. It still yeah. looks like a brain at the big level. But when you really zoom in, those neurons are moving their actual physical location and position and tying themselves to others. I, I heard a colleague of ours back in the day try to equate it to a tennis player. And he was using Andre Agassi, who was very important at the time. And he said, you know, Andre Agassi has seen so many tennis balls moving at such a a fast speed that his brain is neurologically wired to look for the tennis ball faster. And that's partly how an expert is is created, is they, Mm -hmm. we talk about the 10,000 hours of experience. And that, to me, seems adjacent to what you're talking about with this is how the neurology works, but full circle back to, and this is why you have to be so intentional Mm -hmm. about overcoming the negative bias, Mm -hmm. exposing your brain to exactly what you want it to be more responsive to. If you want to be good at tennis, you need to look for tennis balls. But if you're out here not looking at those, yeah. You won't be surprised that you never get good at tennis. And it sounds like you're talking about intentional neuroengineering mm-hmm. oneself. That's right. And this is the practical application of what you're talking about. Extremely well said. And um, for thousands and thousands of years, people have developed themselves in all kinds of ways, mm. like learning, for example, how to uh, shoot a bow and arrow right. or uh, discern where water is located or to pick up the difference between the sound of a predator approaching compared right. to uh, food, mm-hmm. prey approaching. Uh, we, we learn, animals learn. Um, you can train literally a worm hmm. to turn left rather than right wow. at a junction in a maze because there's some kind, something that's aversive on the right, and let's say there's something pleasant like food on the left. You can right. train it. It will learn. Hmm. And then when you, you know, with ethical considerations aside, <laughs> dissect sure. the nervous system of the worm, you will detect discernible lasting changes mm. uh, in a trained worm compared to an untrained worm, mm-hmm. for example. And um, it, to me, the takeaway uh, is gratitude and responsibility. Yeah, The build-out instructions for our brain have been the result of 600 million years of evolution of the nervous system mm. in life altogether. And that's an evolution that occurs through the deaths of a lot of casualties. Right. Many of which uh, didn't make it to pass on their genes just randomly. Mm. It wasn't like they were unfit in some Darwinian sense. Um, But those deaths enabled the tiny incremental mutations, literally, Mm. in one in a hundred thousand, one in a million of individuals who were then a little more uh, capable, whose descendants were a little more likely to survive, mm. which then gradually da 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 thank right. you, evolution, mm-hmm. enabled us to be here today. Uh, who could possibly earn the gift right. of a human brain? Right. Right? Gratitude. Mm. Gratitude. Mm-hmm. What will we do with that gift? Mm. And the second part is because of neuroplasticity, we have a sacred power to be able to uh, we can't change the past, and we can't even change the present as it is occurring. Right. But we can t- can continually influence our future. Wow. If only in terms of our relationship to it, what it is, even if we can't change the circumstances or some of the baggage like chronic illness or mm-hmm. the legacy of trauma, say, that we're carrying with us, at least we can grow in our relationship to it. Mm. So we have this power to influence who we are becoming. Wow. Uh, through literally, uh, for me, it's kind of a very simple summary, deal with the bad, turn to the good, take in the good. Mm. For sure, this is not about bypassing the bad. If anything, this is the how to grow the strengths. This is the essence of deliberate self 
reliance hmm. over time. As you got said earlier, a uh, phrase from Dr. Jeffrey Schwartz at UCLA, uh, self-directed neuroplasticity. Yes. Who are you helping yourself become uh, for, the, for your sake and for the sake of others? Uh, what's the most important minute in your life? Hmm. The next one. Hmm. Minute after minute after minute. So we do have that influence. We do have that power. Where do we rest our attention and what do we do with what it rests upon? Mm. Can we withdraw our attention from the shiny alarming objects that <laughs> right. make us ruminate and feel helpless and hopeless and aggrieved and resentful and like we want to slug somebody? Right. Mm, I understand those feelings. I have them. Mm. But they're not good to allow, as the Buddha put it a long time ago, you know, these things pass through awareness. That's normal. Mm. Don't let them invade and remain. Mm-hmm. That's the distinction, right? And also, can we pull our attention and sustain it with what's good? Like, I appreciate our connection right here. We didn't mm. meet really before I walked in the door here. But you're a great listener. We're present. It's not a million-dollar moment. Sure. But what it is is real. Why not yeah. slow down to absorb it? Mm. And many other, other examples of that. So deal with the bad. Turn to the good. Take in the good. And that uh, sacred power uh, is um, un- cannot be taken from us. Yes. But no one can use it except us. That's so profound. We're responsible for it. And Gosh. so we earn the fruits of our practice. It's poetic. And, and it's, it's uh, I think, a message that we need. As you and I are sitting down here to record this, it's November of 2024. Um, It has been a very long political year, and and a lot of our friends and communities are reeling as change is happening, and um, things are more polarized than ever, stakes are higher than ever, more people are affected by elections in a very personal and direct way than have happened in the past. And a moment ago, you were sharing, you know, we don't have control over things outside of ourselves. There, There are realities that exist. You know, the caveman as well experienced storms and volcanoes and forest fires and bears. And there is this negativity bias, and, and that's to keep us alive. And, and when we are surrounded by a world that is all fire alarms going off at once, right. and, and many of them very legitimately warning us of real fires. It's not all just burning toast. Sometimes there really are dangers that present themselves. I'm hearing what you're sharing as a message of hope, but also I think very importantly, you're not telling us to bury our heads in the ground. I, right. I don't hear you saying, you know, just uh, negative things are a lie. Don't worry about it. Just be be positive, man. It'll all work out. Don't Don't worry. I don't hear that. I, I hear you kind of reflecting, I think, what is also a Buddhist principle of this idea of right-sizing things. You know, I don't think that mm-hmm. Buddhism ever said, pretend like there's nothing bad. I think that Buddha taught, let's be mindful about it in a sense of right-sizing. What is the danger? What is the negative? And, and being of right mind and right action. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if you can kind of share a little bit about this very modern moment that we're in, this very mm. prescient reality of being yeah. surrounded by sticks and fire alarms and scary things. Mm. And here you and I are, two little worms in the maze, trying to navigate and trying to still find a way to, to give ourselves that sacred power of focusing on the positive. I wonder if you have any wisdom for folks that are saying, you know, Dr. Hansen, I just feel overwhelmed right now. There's so much scary. I'm worried that that's going to change who I am, and I'm going to keep recycling on the scary stuff. And that may start to make me a negative person. It may make me toxic. I I may become a person biased toward pain. How do we break free of that at a time when things really are still scary? So much in that question. There is. It's loaded. First, I would like to make a distinction between uh, being positive, uh, enjoying every sandwich, Mm -hmm. smell the roses. All that's wonderful. Mm. And it's not really what I'm talking about. Okay. What I'm really talking about is the essence of self-reliance mm. based on recognizing that the world is challenging. Yes. And we've got a brain that's negatively biased. So I'll tell you four questions that mm. I come back to again and again as a clinician mm-hmm. that people can also use themselves. First question is, what's the challenge? Mm. And especially, what's the experience of the challenge? Mm-hmm. So let's say there was an election that was razor thin close. Hypothetically. Uh, or factually, <laughs> uh, you know, fit 52, 50.2, wow. 50.2. Holy and smokes. that number will probably decline a little and further <laughs> as all the votes from you know California and other mm-hmm. states come in. 50.2% of the American people elected 
reelected Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Some are celebrating that fact. Some are not celebrating that fact. A person can accept the results of an election while being deeply concerned about it its consequences. Yeah. So these things are, are real. What's the challenge? Mm. Including as you experience the challenge, first question. Mm -hmm. Second question is the key question. What if it were more present inside you, in your heart, in your mind, in your being, in your consciousness? What if it were more present inside you as a trait mm. would really help you? Mm -hmm. Wow. Right? That's the strength. Yeah. What are we trying to grow? Mm. And then the third question is, how can you experience that which you want to grow. Mm. Because that's the first of the two necessary steps for any lasting healing, growing, or awakening, mm. which involve an underlying physical change in your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, how can you experience that, str that particular strength? Well, first of all, you're already probably experiencing it some of the time. Mm. And second, you can probably do deliberate things to experience fill in the blank, greater calm, mm -hmm. greater sense of self-compassion, greater commitment to social justice and protection and being an ally for others, mm. greater um, clarity that you're just not going to watch so much news. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, better social skills uh, uh, to be able to say, no, Uncle Bob, I don't want to talk about politics mm. at Thanksgiving. Yeah. Because you know where that's going to go. That's a tunnel <laughs> with no cheese. Okay. Right. So you experience it. And then fourth step, how can I help that experience really sink in? Mm. By keeping the neurons firing together for a breath or longer, feeling it in your body and doing other things that help that pattern of activation become consolidated mm. in uh, your own brain, hardwired increasingly into you. So what's the challenge? What resource, what inner strength would really help? And then how can you experience it and how can you internalize it? So that's the frame for me very much. Mm. I work backwards mm -hmm. from the standpoint of um, helping people heal from their childhoods and right. manage their current lives and have a better future. What are we trying to grow inside? You mm. know, I have a longtime rock climber, you know, wilderness person. What's in your backpack? You know, the, right. you know what's in your wallet, blah, blah. Uh -huh. What's in your backpack? <laughs> yeah. You know, what do you want to take with you mm. down the long road of life? So, okay, that's kind of a frame. I love so it. So what, given the current moment, mm. including politically, um, would be really, really useful to have more of? Hmm. And uh, here at UNLV, I'm giving a series of talks, and people can find the, the um, essence of it online already, hmm. which are basically four strengths, four broad principles that um, are found in science, they're found in history, they're found in clinical practice for what's in our own power that we can do when the bottom falls out. Yes. Of one kind or another. I live in California, wildfires. I've had friends who've had their homes in Colorado as, yes. as well as in California burnt to the ground. What mm. do you do when that bottom falls out? Mm -hmm. What do you do when you get a diagnosis of a serious, maybe a terminal illness? Sure. Bottom falls out. What do you do when um, you go to college and suddenly you, you find out that three professors have been shot right. or other shooters in your city? Whoa, violence, yeah. you know? And what do you do when, let's say, there's an election in which despite everything and inclusive of everything, mm. roughly two thirds of your fellow adult citizens are either really happy with um, the person who got elected mm. or they don't care enough right. to vote for that person's opponent. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. what do we do now? Right, and so what are the four strengths? I'll just name yes. them, and then I'll shut up because you're an awesome interviewer. You are. <laughs> I've been interviewed by a lot of people. That's an opportunity for you to take in the good. By the way, <laughs> thank. You. Briefly, I'll just hit the headlines. First strength: take heart. Mm. Tune into the heart. The heart is the source of courage. The root of the word for courage comes from heart. Mm. Uh, get in touch with love flowing in and love flowing out. It feeds us as it flows through us. Have compassion for yourself. Uh, find heart. And mm. especially, get on your own side. Be kind to yourself. Yes. As, again, a clinician, I bet you know this is true yourself. Half the clients who would come in to see me, I, I didn't realize why what I was doing wasn't working until I got it. Oh, I'm pumping them full of, metaphorically, yeah. gas, yeah. although I have a certain amount of hot air coming <laughs> out. I'm pumping them up with, let's say, gas, but there's no pilot light. Ah, we got to ignite the pilot light. They're yes. loyal to others. They care about others. They come mm. through for others. They don't come through for themselves. Mm -hmm. They're indifferent to their own pain. Whoa, 
not because they're bad or dumb, often because for them, they were trained mm-hmm. to put others first endlessly or trained that, that it's a sin or mm-hmm. because of trauma and other reasons they felt like ashamed of themselves. Yeah, unworthy. Like they didn't deserve mm-hmm. to uh, be loyal to. And that's really important to correct. So that's under the heading of take heart. Yes. Right? Second, see clearly. Mm. Sort out what is performative BS to grab your attention and what is a real threat coming your way. Mm. On the one hand, um, I remember reading this uh, fellow who grew up in Haiti during the time of Duvalier and Pop and Baby Doc, these oh, terrible, yeah. terrible, terrible, terrible times. Yeah. He escaped Haiti uh, just ahead of the death squads as a very young man, ended up in Canada, washed dishes, wow. started writing, very talented, eventually got in the highest honor, highest literary honor in France for writing in French. Oh, the wow. only, and the first one ever given to someone who was not born in France. Wow. So quite a, quite a person. And uh, he said, you know, uh, when you're living in a dictatorship or you're on the slippery slope in that direction, mm. they want to get into your head. They want you to talk about them all the time. They want you to think about them all the time. They don't care if you like them. Oh, wow. They just want to get in your head. They huh. want to occupy yes. you and invade your mind and remain, to huh. use that phrase again. And so it's really important to guard your attention in terms of seeing clearly you mm-hmm. know, what is just performative BS, but also see the real threats heading your way mm. or heading toward those you care about. As Maya Angelou put it, um, when people show you who they are, believe them mm-hmm. the first time. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just simply a fact. Mm. If you look at the playbook throughout history of the movement into tyranny, mm. uh, I was recently just reading about the rise of Hitler mm-hmm. and the, the steps, 1932, 1933, 1934, the early days. Mm. Whoa. Okay. Mm. Other similar playbooks. Great book, Timothy Snyder on tyranny. Mm. Anne Applebaum, a great writer. Mm-hmm. It's really clear that America is already at least a few steps down that slippery slope toward minimally what's called authoritarian democracy, Mm. pseudo-democracy, if not all the way Mm -hmm. to, you know, a dictatorship or oligarchy by another name. Mm. That's just not alarmism. That's a fact. Sure, sure. There's a way to measure this. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know exactly what they'll look like. We don't know how often they'll come, but storms are coming. Yes. So see clearly. That's the second strength to grow. Mm. And then the third strength is to uh, take... Do what you can. Mm. Take the action that you can. I think about this wonderful teaching from Nikosi Johnson, this Mm. little boy born with HIV in South Africa, Mm. died at 12. Mm. And he became an advocate for people with HIV AIDS, especially children. And he said, do all that you can with what you've been given Mm. in the place where you are Mm. in the time that you have. Mm. So that's what we do. We do what we can. And we do it at the local level. We, you know, batten down our own hatches, maybe update our passport or if we have options, you know, start, uh, you know, developing more of a nest egg, uh, you know, get our paperwork up to date, whatever it is. Empower yourself. Yeah, at a personal level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Take care of your health. Realize that, you know, you get back what you put in to what (laughs) you eat, how you exercise and where you rest your mind, including in the meditations or prayers Mm. that you do. Uh, for sure that. Um, and also, I have a bee in my bonnet about uh, facing the fact that while uh, enormous progress has been made in human history, mm. for the average person today, average eight, average 8 billion, this is the safest, most peaceful, healthiest time ever to be alive. Mm. That's a fact. It does not deny that Horribly, 10,000 children a day die of hunger-related causes. Right. Doesn't change those facts. Mm -hmm. But still, there's been a lot of progress. So it's important to appreciate progress and take heart from the progress and learn from the progress. Both can be true. But clearly, it is not generally addressed Mm -hmm. the underlying structural, systemic sources of injustice Mm -hmm. and immiseration Mm -hmm. that profit the few at the cost of the many. That's Mm -hmm. just a plain fact. Sure. What are we going to do? Mm-hmm. How do we get at that deeper root? And I have two opinions. <laughs> <laughs> what a surprise. It's not, it's not easy. It's, not, it's yeah. not always simple. There's complexity to this. Learning from what people uh, have said who are really expert at this. Mm. 
uh, we need to do two things. First, at a cultural level and an individual consciousness level, we need to what's called rehumanize. Yes. Or as the um, chair of the board of the Global Compassion Coalition, Mampella Rampelli, an historic figure from South Africa, anti- anti-apartheid, has said, we need to be indigenous again. Mm. We need to reclaim the ancestral wisdom that our ancestors had for 290,000 years of our 300,000 year so far tenure on this planet as this species, right. um, who lived in small bands on the basis of what's called caring and sharing, wow. compassion and justice. Mm. And that uh, primal way of doing politics mm. in a group of 40 or so people right. who lived most of their life together yeah. right, has been blown up mm. over the last 10,000 years, uh, and which is why most of us in the last 10,000 years have lived kind of in a Game of Thrones. Right. sort of setting. And so we need to come back to the recognition that we are all truly in this together. Mm-hmm. We need to rehumanize. And we need to find ways to address the fact that the disease of our age is uh, as someone, I believe, um, um, Ellie Weissel, mm-hmm. great um, survivor of the Holocaust, yes. great activist, and so on, wise being, said the opposite of love is not hate, it's indifference. Oh, wow. If you just look at... The, the American electorate, something like 67 million people are not registered to vote. Mm. They just don't care. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Think of the people who just sat out the election. They don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we have a real issue with caring, and then we have also pernicious forces that are trying to drive wedges in between people to disrupt the vital need to widen the circle of us. Mm. When we all live together, it's just 40 or so people. Right. We yeah. didn't have to work hard. You have a very strong sense of us, mm. okay? How do we have a strong sense of us now mm. when you walk past a 1,000 strangers every day? Right. Probably. How do you expand that circle of us? Mm-hmm. So we have our work cut out, but that's what rehumanizing is about. And then the other thing is I just observe so many people and nonprofits not coming together to form a coalition Mm. that will get something actual done. Mm -hmm. I see businesses competing at the local level and um, yet cooperating at the political level. Mm -hmm. I see very many pro-social nonprofits. I live in this world. Right. You know, a lot of Mm do-gooders are wonderful at the individual level. Right. And they almost never cooperate Mm. at the political policy level at a scale that's big enough to make any darn bit of difference. Right. So we need to really form our coalitions. That's where we have opportunity in the space between government action and individual action. Mm. Okay. So that's do what you can. And then last headline, the strength. Yes. Find peace. Mm. Amidst the storms, realize that most people throughout history have lived under the thumb or the boot of a tyrant. Yes. They found their ways. Mm. Not, I'm not um, minimizing or no. sugarcoating it. I'm no. just saying if they found their ways right. in Babylonia or mm-hmm. in Middle Ages or right. you know, being a peasant in China a thousand right. years ago, sure. uh, they found their own ways. And gosh, we can find our ways today. And there are other ways to find peace. Exhale mm-hmm. slowly. Mm-hmm. That's going to help you be more peaceful. Yeah. Uh, raise your gaze to the horizon neurologically. That will mm-hmm. help you, you know, get a bigger picture. Also, take comfort and refuge in what endures. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the good work that you've done, Jim, mm-hmm. cannot be touched by the recent election, for right. example. Um, you know, the, the sky that is blue, the taste mm-hmm. of a banana with Chocolate and peanut butter. Okay. Now that's the trifecta. That is. That's, that's all the, the pieces tri- at once. That is it. That's, that's the, the tri- holy trinity. That's yeah. it. Right there. <laughs> right there. You know. And also your own innate goodness. Right. Like it cannot be taken from you. That mm. you have a fundamentally good heart. Yeah. Even if there's some lapses, you have a fundamentally good heart. Mm-hmm. And that is something you can take refuge in. And deep down inside all of us. If you just look, I've come off right now a three-week meditation retreat, so I'm mm. particularly aware of it um, now several weeks later. Um, but still, if you let your mind quiet a little bit, you will observe. a lot. Of, you will see things changing, right? Thoughts come, feelings come, sounds, sights, so forth, changing. What doesn't change? What's deeper than changing? Right. right? There's a stillness deep within all of us, and you look more closely, that stillness is benevolent. It's loving. It has a caring, a kindness in it. 
It's, it's not malevolent. It's not mean. Um, it looks to help. It looks to build, not destroy. Mm. That's innate mm. in all of us. And um, we can find peace by resting in that deep refuge. So those are four strengths. I love Four it. things we can do. No one can stop us from, right, taking heart, mm-hmm. seeing clearly, doing what you can, mm-hmm. and finding peace. Wow. You know, and there's so many takeaways from, from those many points. I mean, one of them I think is very true, and it's something that we can get lost in. Life is local. Yes, there are big things happening all over the world. But for a lot of us, when we're treating somebody who's going through their fears and seeing things on here and they'll say, oh, my goodness, I I hear that this new attorney general is a bad person and I think they're taking money from some bad person and doing bad things and and they're going to get a house in the Bahamas. And then you might want to bring them back to the now and and bring back to the power of now and where your feet are and, and ask them, but does that affect what you're going to have for lunch? Well, no, but but I am concerned. That's fine, too. Both can be true as a citizen and as somebody who wants fairness and justice in your world. I'm glad you're alarmed. I'm glad you're concerned. I'm glad you're engaged. But we also need to differentiate that reality from your reality, your truth. Your life is local. It's here with me right now. We're on a beautiful campus on a beautiful day. We're going to have a great evening. It's Las Vegas. It's November. This is the best time to be here, and almost every other time is terrible. (laughs) And This is where we're in our reality, and we've got to be where our feet are. And I'm hearing you kind of personalize that. You're giving people back their power with those four points, saying Mm -hmm. this can be something under your control, even in a world out of control. And and one of those last things that you had said yeah. I thought was so profound is this idea that, you know, we ancestrally worked as units. We, mm-hmm. we had small communities. Mm-hmm. There were only so many of us. And, and I, I remember in that really wonderful book, uh, Sapiens, yeah. they talked about um, how large troops of primates can even really get yeah. uh, before they just don't do that anymore. They split off and create other troops. And it kind of manifests this signal of there's only so many names you'll memorize, so many yeah. you know relationships you can actively have. But I'm noticing we're seeing, especially in the internet age, this creation of small community. We're creating these smaller bodies of like-minded, pro-mental health, pro-support, kind bodies of humans. And when I think about that, and I think about that as a manifestation of control and what we can empower ourselves with, I think about what you've done. I think about your show Mm -hmm. and and the way you have created with your son uh, an online community of people that are thinking clearly, are encouraging each other, are rooting for each other, and are manifesting a sense of empowerment in the world. And, and especially during crazy times and, and more than ever when things feel out of control, we need those voices. We need, and it's so interesting because, you know, you and I are obviously podcasters and mental health professionals. But but I have to tell you, I'm envious of you. And, and I want to tell you why, uh, Rick, two things. So you're being well podcast. It's one of the most listened to shows in the mental health genre. I don't envy you that. I envy that you've gotten your son to listen to you Uh every single week and hang out with you and take advice. And and I have a teenage son and I think, all right, Rick, teach me your tricks. Oh, Jim, you are on to it. How did you get this? (laughs) Is the whole podcast a sham? Is it just a front to hang out with your son? (laughs) uh, To be frank, I'm not sure which of the several tied for first place reasons uh, that one is, but it's certainly in that group. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, one of the smartest things I did as a parent is I learned how to play the game magic mm. with our son. Magic, the card game, the yeah, gathering. The yeah, gathering. yeah, exactly right. Uh, really a clever, interesting game. And I played it with a lot of my therapy clients, too, who are, oh, wow. who are kids and taught them how to play and things like that. Uh, so that was that was a pretty good move. Mm. Well, that's thank you. That's quite an observation. Well, I'm curious. So your your show being well, like mm-hmm. I had mentioned earlier, it's one of the most popular shows in the genre. Um, it is dynamic. It is weekly, and it's very practical. You you cover all sorts of things. It's so eclectic. You know, mm-hmm. I think I can always tell whenever you must be traveling or things are happening because Forrest is interviewing all sorts of folks, and then otherwise y'all are taking questions and giving feedback. Sometimes taking on big topics. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you could share with us the story of when you decided to create this show, what the blueprint was, and and, and how to create a show with your son. What a neat project to get to do. What's the genesis? What's the backstory of of the Being Well podcast? Well, I'm pausing to reflect on what could be of general interest to people. Uh, As best I can recall, 
Forrest and I wrote the book Resilient, mm. which really gets at what I think of as 12 fundamental core strengths, inner strengths yes. that we can develop. Quick sidebar, for all the you know, discussion of nature versus nurture and all the rest of that, roughly, on average, two-thirds of the variance mm. in any significant psychological characteristic like resilience mm-hmm. or self-worth or happiness um, is acquired rather than innate. Okay. Only about one-third is based on what are heritable factors mm. on average. Now, for mm-hmm. some people, heritable factors make a huge difference, or for other people, environmental or psychological factors make a huge difference. But the bottom line point is that on average, about two-thirds of who we are becoming over mm. the lifespan is up for grabs mm-hmm. based on the nature of our society and forces like poverty or bias or good fortune, as well as what we do inside ourselves. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of wild to appreciate yes. that, you know, when you think about, wow, two-thirds roughly of who I am and certainly who I am becoming is up for grabs. Mm-hmm. Whoa, do I want to be just passive and inert right. and spun down the river of life right. like twirling in a motorboat with no power on? Or do I want to put my arm on the, my That's hand on the right. tiller Decide get for the myself. motor going yeah. and direct myself as best I can right. given the cliffs and the shoals and the alligators? Yes. All right. So that was the book Resilient. It's mm. about 12 of those fundamental strengths like compassion. Uh, learning is mm. a fundamental strength. Learning is a meta strength. It's the strength that grows the other strengths mm. and all the rest of them. So we started doing that. And then I said, well, why don't we do a kind of a podcasty thing? I guess wow. I'd heard about podcasts, so we'll go through the <laughs> book he and I did. We went through the 12 chapters, 12 months, and basically each one of them is broken into four separate things. So that mm. not coincidentally gave us 48, 52 weeks in the year. Sure. So we did that for the first year. I already had some audience which helped, and I think the combination of the two of us was good, and Forrest is phenomenal. Yes. He's just really good at Sharp. it. Sharp. Yep. And really good at the business side as well and the social media aspects. And we caught a wave. A fair amount of life is just, uh, wow. you know, you can learn how to surf and be good at it, but you still need the wave. <laughs> right. And you need both. Yeah. Right, so right place, you, right time, yeah, and you know right. how to surf. <laughs> and then it just kind of went from there. And it wow. is, as we, you and I were just talking about this, uh, part of me, I'm a, you know, I'm a kind of scruffy revolutionary kind of person. I'm mm-hmm. an aging hippie. And <laughs> I am delighted by, I think it was the three Ds in the time in which we live, this era of dis- digitalized, distributed, mm-hmm. and democratized yes. access to tools, mm-hmm. including mm-hmm. psychological tools. Yes. I remember being, a, I think, pretty young um, when the Whole Earth Catalog came out, mm-hmm. if you vaguely recall that, mm-hmm. in later editions, access to tools. So I deeply believe in the opportunity for people around the world, unless they're behind some dictatorial wall that does not give them access to this, but around the world who can, late at night, I imagine, frankly, a mom Mm -hmm. in Kuwait Mm -hmm. uh, who has had an argument with her husband. He goes to bed. She's like, "Hmm." and she can go online and find help. Yeah. Uh, Something to do that will help her with mm. whatever all that was. And I just imagine that, or I imagine all kinds of other people listening to you mm. and getting help in all kinds of ways. So I just feel enormously privileged yes. and happy to be able to just you know offer what we can right. in the world. So much of what I think people suffer is thwarted contribution. Mm. It's withheld love, blocked mm. love. And uh, we do that to adolescents a lot. We do that to college students a lot. We don't really give them opportunities to contribute. We sequester them in these kind of strange reservations, you know, malls and schools. Right. Uh, and then we wonder why they're so unhappy. And uh, they don't believe us when we say, no, 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 you need to learn this and that and give up sex, drugs, and rock and roll. <laughs> right. So you can be like me in 10 years. Yeah, right. And they're like, oh, yeah, I don't like that part. Nice try, Pops. Pops. <laughs> yeah. Right. So I just think that uh, we're blessed, you and I and others who do this kind of thing, including mm-hmm. your own three other partners, mm-hmm. uh, to um, be able to make our contributions and to know that in this life, uh, at the end of it all, um, we gave what we could. Mm. Yes. So as we get to the end of our time together, um, I want to take a beat to 
reflect on anything that you are working on. Um, you know, you seem to be very busy with publishing and speaking and podcasting and, and providing all this education and access. Um, and I, I, I sense no slowing down. I sense that the world, as it's changing and becoming, you know, more interesting to deal with, um, you're stepping up, not stepping back. Mm. And, and I'm curious if you can kind of share with us some of the things you're passionate about and if there are things that you want the audience to hear about that they can say, you know what, I'm, I'm fired up. I'm excited about what this person's talking about. I want to be a part of change in my life. I want to be part of positive change in the world. Um, I want to make sure we take a beat to reflect and offer them, hey, if you're interested in th- what I'm talking about, if you want to read more, if you want to get engaged, mm. here are some places that you can start looking. Here are some projects that I'm working on. Tell us what you've been up to and where folks can find more of it. That's very kind. And again, you're supremely skillful. <laughs> it's really funny. So here I am, reverse role. Right? And I'm, <laughs> I'm watching someone with a lot of game. Uh, in the best game recognized game, as the kids uh, say. Go, go, go rebels, right? <laughs> anyway. Um, well, first at a personal level, there is a developmental trajectory in life. Mm. And what is developmentally appropriate? And uh, I am now in my very early 70s. And... I'm super healthy. Mine's very alive. Uh, my parents lived to quite an old age, so I'm fortunate genetically in that way, while knowing that the lights could go out at mm-hmm. any moment mm-hmm. and to live with that mm. and to live in contentment right. and peacefulness and gratitude for uh, what an amazing ride it's already been. Mm. That said, I am really dialing back. I'm okay. doing less and less uh, mm. work-related things mm-hmm. to make more room for Deep practice, wilderness, family, mm. friends, fooling around. Mm-hmm. All that said, all that said, the older I get, the calmer I get. Mm. I've been meditating since 1974, off and on, last 30 plus years, very on. The older I get, the calmer I get, and the madder I get. Mm. Mm-hmm. At, like I was getting at earlier, that deeper level yeah. of injustice, exploitation, bias, mm-hmm. casual indifference to the suffering of others, the routine, what's called in economics, externalizing of costs, mm-hmm. dumping your garbage mm-hmm. out the window mm. that others have to pick up, smokestacks spewing you know, carbon into the atmosphere, right. um, and all kinds of other externalizing of costs on others. I'm mad about it. Yeah. You know, I'm a person who practices with anger. I try to use anger rather mm. than let it use me. Um, so based on that, like of a lot of other people who, in part because we have made the progress we've made, we now are no longer running for our lives day to day, most right. of us, We can look around and increasingly be clear, wait a second, wait a second, 10,000 years of Game of Thrones. Hmm. Now we're living in a more, you know, upholstered and... Yeah, indoor plumbing's pretty great. Yeah, Yeah, We've got some cool things. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. (laughs) So that's why I founded the Global Compassion Coalition, Mm. which other people can check out, and I invite them to check out. The fundamental idea is that... um, We need to reestablish what worked for us uh, as a species, as you said, at the local level. Mm. And then everything was local, Mm -hmm. basically. Small bands, essentially. That's local, uh, even as they wandered hunting and gathering. Uh, How do we reestablish that sense of common good, common welfare, Mm. common truth, and common justice? How do we reestablish that? at the scale of 8 billion people, (sighs) so that no more children die of starvation every day, so that all girls have access to a decent education, so that Mm. nuclear weapons are never, ever used, and so that we stop dumping um, something on the order of 100 million tons a day Mm. of greenhouse gases into the sky. Wow. And, you know, people might want to add a couple other items to that list, but that's a pretty darn good starter list. It's a good list. Yeah, how do we actually have a world by the end of the century. Right. By 2100. It took wow. us 10,000 years to get here. It's going to take us a few centuries to get out of here. Mm. But if we keep the end in view um, and actually ask ourselves what needs to happen in the world so that no more children die of hunger? Mm. What needs to happen so that all girls are educated? 
what needs to happen so that at least half the people in the world, rather than the current 6%, live in a high-functioning democracy? Yes. What do we need to do? And the only way to accomplish that is to come together in coalitions Mm. at different scales to claim the power we actually have to make things happen. So that's what the Global Compassion Coalition is all about. I love it. So if people want to check that out, and it's a platform for whatever you, whoever you are, uh, that is at bottom, you know, motivated by care and concern for others and yourself. Right. Not just yourself. Uh, You know, there's a great platform, great opportunity, tons of resources, well-intended, world-class experts on compassion science are involved there. And uh, I really encourage people to find out more and hop on board. I love and you it. can just Google Global Compassion Coalition, and they'll take you to our website. Wonderful. This has been such a great opportunity. I really appreciate you taking the time. I know you are so busy. No. You've got so many folks waiting on you, and, and you're just taking the time to say, let's just sit down and talk. And, and I just feel like I am so overjoyed to get that one-on-one opportunity. Oh, nothing, yeah. You have taught us so much. And, and I got to tell you, Dr. Hansen, at a time in the world where so many folks have never been more confused and never felt more disempowered. I think you've spent the last hour teaching us, here's how you on an individual level Mm -hmm. can get some amount of control and restoration and most importantly, peace. And also, here's how you as a human and a member of our community can take action. Here's how you can get motivated. Like you said a second ago, I'm not going to let anger use me but I will use anger yeah. to motivate me yeah. to be a force for good in the world. And there's plenty of good work to do. And you know what? You bring up such a good point because sometimes I think we get so lost in the things outside of our control. We forget about all the many things inside of our control. Yeah. How how profound it would be to assist one person in your community that you would be the biggest source of change in their life. And you could assist them or get involved in a local project or support a local Girl Scout troop or, or, or a local group at a healthcare hospital, places that need your support now at the local level. Mm-hmm. That could be a force for good. Mm-hmm. And that is the most meaningful thing sometimes that we can do. And I love that you've given us back that sense of dignity and power at a time when I think folks really miss those feelings and they mm. need it the most. I want to, if I could build on what you just said there, Jim, that's so good. Um, <clears throat> I remember reading a book a million years ago, I think it was called On Lying. Mm. It was a book about lying, mm-hmm. which is really interesting. Yeah. And they made, the author made the brilliant point that the lie affects both mm. the recipient of the lie and the liar themselves. Wow. Right? And that's really interesting to contemplate on. Flip it around today. Think about the petitions we sign, the dollars we send, the ballots we submit. Uh, we do these things. You know, the stands we take, mm. uh, the ways in which, for example, when Uncle Bob, let's say, goes off on Thanksgiving, ranting about this or that, no relationship to reality at all, mm. a fact-free rant. Okay? Mm-hmm. We don't nod along. But instead, we just kind of sit quietly Mm. uh, because it's Thanksgiving Mm -hmm. and Uncle Bob took us fishing and he's a really (laughs) good guy. I like Uncle Bob. Yeah, even though (laughs) though X and Y. Sure. But we don't give him agreement. Mm. We sit in dignity. Mm. I I remember, um, and I hope I, and I really offer this with respect, reading uh, someone, it might have been Ann Scott Mamaday, Mm. great um, Native Mm -hmm. American writer, who said something like, uh, you know, the Native Americans, one of, their, one of their greatest weapons was silence. Oh, wow. And Every, in therapy, offering silence is a very important That's tool. very interesting. But I mean, it now here in kind of a moral, yes. withholding a sound. Non-agreement. Withholding mm-hmm. a sound. Mm. Maybe that's all we can do. So whatever it is, mm-hmm. petitions, dollars, votes, right. withholding agreement. Mm-hmm. We're standing in solidarity, moving closer mm. to the person who somehow other people are, you know, dumping on. Okay. We may not be able to affect the outcome outside ourselves. Mm. But that petition, that dollar, right. that vote, that stand affects us. I like that. We feel better for it. We know we did our bit. Mm. And um, in ways that I think are often mysterious, mm. uh, it builds merit mm. in our own lives mm. and in ripples going out into the world, keeps helping to make the world a better place. 
Dr. Rick Hansen, thank you so much for joining us on Pod Therapy. It's been an honor. I'm so excited to put into practice what you're teaching us today. Folks, if you'd like to hear more of Dr. Rick Hansen, you can check out the Being Well podcast and uh, just Google the man's name and you will find all of his works, seven great books, so much wonderful contribution uh, which, as he just admitted, he did selfishly. He did it because it makes him feel good. <laughs> because well, it changes that was him. some of it. But okay. <laughs> Cut N- this man's mic. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> oh, Dr. Rick Hansen, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been a while. You take care. Same. <laughs>